And finally, as a way to tie things kind of together and also to provide some kind of contrast, I guess, between electric field and electrical potential. Part A we've dealt with quite a bit in the last chapter, so I'll try and go fairly quickly through it. And then in part B, I'll show you how to deal with electrical potential with multiple point charges. And if anything, you probably find it much easier because potential has to do with energy and is therefore a scalar property, no direction required. But first, let's do part A. Again, we make up a little chart tracking various things for A and B because we have multiple charges. This gets repeated. Uh, we have two nano coulomb, we have two nano coulomb there, one's positive, one's negative. In terms of the electric field at point P, the direction is given by which one's positive, which one's negative. We can mark this down here, positive, negative. Being positive, the electric field goes away from point A and then goes towards point B. Write that, and because this is two centimeter and two centimeter, we know that this is a 45 degree angle. Being away and being towards goes kind of downwards, and I can find out that angle by using this triangle here 10 minus 1 of 4 over 2, opposite over adjacent we get 63.43 degrees, so 64.43 degrees. The next thing we need, of course, is our R, and you can use Pythagoras for that, two square plus two square square root, converting to meters, you get that, and then two square plus four square square root, you get that. The size of the E, of course, is K, Q over R square. No different, using just the magnitudes here. And the complete R, just plugging numbers in, you won't even show it because you've seen it many times before. And you get that. With that, we break it down into x and y, defining, of course, some kind of positive x, some kind of positive y. So this is negative e cosine 45, because it's going to the left. We get some number, we get them per coulomb in terms of units. For the y of this one, it's going to be positive, because it points upwards, and it'll be sine 45 which gives us the exact same number. Likewise for the B, which happens to be negative for both the X and the Y, using my 64 degrees, we can work these things out. I'm summing up my X and Y separately, we'll get some numbers of electric fields. Using Pythagoras then to work out my magnitude. And then we have a negative x, positive y, call that theta. You can work out that theta is 26.4 degrees. So therefore, the total electric field at point P must be something like that. And it kind of makes sense because if you draw the entire field out, you'll find that this one side, positive, all the charges leaves it, and then in the middle, it goes from this towards that, and it kind of bends around like that, and maybe even that one as well. So same thing over here. Because they're symmetric, they're gonna get the same amount of charge. Being symmetric, but our point P isn't symmetric, it's kind of two-thirds of the way this way and up like that, so say point P is over here. So you can see how the EP kind of looks like that, which makes sense, I guess, given the direction of 20 degrees or so. 
Okay, part B. This here we're talking about potential, so it's kq over r, not kq over r square. And once again, we have multiple charges, so we'll be doing a bunch of similar calculations. So let's make a chart. Different though, because we're dealing with potential, we no longer have to deal with direction, but we do have to know the sign of the chart. So don't forget the sign here because that will give you a different potential. For the R, we figured out before, that's no different in meters. And then V in terms of volts, we can plug it in here and get these numbers. And notice I do keep the sign. No direction, but there is a sign. When you add it up, so the total voltage is of course the voltage from A plus the voltage from B. Adding them up with the sign, you end up with 233.67 volts or 234 volts. So positive voltage makes sense because it's closer to the positive charge. And we can go back and revisit our electric field diagram and draw in what we call equal potential lines. So as I mentioned, the equal potential line is always perpendicular to my electric field lines because you have to go perpendicular to the electric field to not gain any potential. Again, I remind you that we have this parallel bit is very important. So say down the middle, you know that it all looks like that perpendicular, perpendicular, perpendicular. And because of the relative size here, I know exactly that that must be, must be zero volts. So anywhere to the right of that, I should get some more positive voltage. And indeed I do. And here, the equal potential line sort of curves a bit because it has to be perpendicular there and perpendicular there and perpendicular there. And this just so happened to be 334 volts. Uh, you can do a similar thing on this side, negative 234 volts. And then you can make tighter circles as long as, you know, it always meets perpendicular like that. So you can kind of see these patterns forming. And why we favor drawing these equal potential lines because it's much easier to stick a voltmeter in here in between these two points and kind of run this line along to f identify all the equal potential lines and from the equal potential lines then we can infer the resulting electric field. It's much harder to measure the electric field directly because otherwise you have to put a charge in there and measure how it moves. And these things being very small, that's not very easy to do. We can have more elaborate charge configuration to give us more elaborate patterns like these. But for the most part, we'll usually just pick one point and then you can calculate out the effect from each of the charges, whether it be about electric field, where you have to decompose in a direction and add up the components, or electrical potential, where we simply add up the positive or negative potential as they come.